Okay, chapter 18 uh, is work and energy or conservation of energy. We've done this before. Remember back uh, a few chapters ago, uh, we have done work, energy, and conservation of energy for particles. Uh, but now we are looking at rigid bodies. Right, now we are looking at rigid bodies, but it's very similar. And remember, back when we were doing particles, we, we kind of did two methods. One method was kind of a work energy method where we just summed up all the work, whether it was conservative forces or not. We summed up all the work. Even We even said that gravity does work, which I don't really like. Um, but all the work equals the change in kinetic energy. But then we... The next uh, section, we said, well, let's just rearrange that equation and let's say it turns into a conservation of energy equation. Right? It's the same ideas, the same equations, but now we, we said, okay, springs and gravity, those are potential energy. Uh, let's don't think about the work done by a spring or gravity. Let's think about potential energy. So we, we said all of the energy initial, the potential energy plus kinetic energy, plus any external you know, work that's added or subtracted to our, um, to our system by an external force equals all the energy final. And I, I prefer the conservation of energy method. Um, and so for rigid bodies, if you don't mind, I, I'm just going to kind of stick with conservation of energy. Let's just focus on conservation of energy for rigid bodies. It's, it's really the same equation. Remember this equation, right? The potential energy initial plus kinetic energy initial plus the external non-conserved work, like a force times a distance, um, equals the energy final, potential energy final plus kinetic energy final. Um, now that we have rigid bodies, we have uh, two things that, that, I, that I'm thinking about, right? With particles... All the forces were just, we assumed they were just acting through the middle of the object, acting through the center of the object. Um, but now that we have rigid bodies, we have objects that have size, they have height, all these for, some, a force is acting on the edge of this rigid body, a force is acting on the top or the bottom of this rigid body. The two things we need to worry about right, are moments right now we have moments and what do moments cause now we have rotation uh, that we didn't have to worry about for particles now we have to worry about that for rigid bodies so how does that show up in our conservation of energy equation you kind of can see where i you know put some little spaces right here um, that we're going to have a couple extra terms that deal with moments and rotation. Think, think, see if you can go ahead and kind of guess these terms that, that we're gonna have now that we have moments and rotation. All right, well, potential energy will, will stay the same, right? We, we were talking about the potential energy in springs and the potential energy due to gravity, and, and those are still the same, 1 fkx squared and mgh. We also still have kinetic energy, right? Energy in the, the motion, right? We have, and we still have linear kinetic energy, this one half mv squared, but we also have a different type of kinetic energy. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with this, um, but now that we have rotation, instead, we, we still have the one half m, the, the linear velocity squared, but now we also have angular velocity, right? So what do you think the angular equivalent to linear kinetic energy? Uh, it's this rotational kinetic energy. I'm not sure if you've seen this before. You could probably guess what the equation is, right? Instead of one half mv squared for our linear kinetic energy, it's going to be one half i Omega squared. That I, remember, is the mass moment of inertia. It's kind of the angular mass. It's the object's resistance to rotation times the angular velocity squared. It's one-half I omega squared. Could, could you have guessed that, right? So that's the initial one-half I omega squared. We're also going to have the final omega squared right down here. Okay, for um, the 
non-conserved work, um, that was like a force times a distance, and we still might have that. So if, if a force acts a distance, then force times distance. Remember, the FD is really for a constant force, and that distance is along the same line of action of the force. If it's a little bit more complicated, you might have to take just a, a component of the force that acts a certain distance, or it's really integral F um, dotted with dr. Uh, but if it's an external constant force, it's force times distance. We're going to have something else, another non-conserved work. Now that we have rotation, now that we have moments instead of force times distance, what if we have an external moment acting a certain angle theta? So, so m theta we might have. Now similarly, this, is, this would be for a constant moment um, acting a certain di uh, angular displacement theta. But same idea as force times distance. Now we also have moments that act certain thetas. This theta needs to be in radians, so make sure our theta is in radians, not degrees. Um, and, and this is like this is a, an external moment, right? Like these forces are external uh, forces. So this is like a moment that is drawn on there, a couple moment, a free vector, you know, that is being twisted on our object. It's not really a force with a moment arm. Um, remember, if, if there are any forces, those would show up right there in that FD term. Uh, but if there's a, a moment, a couple moments drawn on you know, our system, then that would be right there, a moment times a theta. Uh, remember that for force times distance, if the force is in the same direction as our distance, we would say plus FD. Um, but if the force was in the opposite direction as the distance, then it'd be minus FD. What do you think about this? m times theta. Similarly, if the moment is in the same direction as the theta, then it'd, it'd be positive. So if both of them are clockwise, that's going to be plus m theta. If both of them are counterclockwise, it's still going to be plus m theta. It, it would be negative when one of them is one direction and, and, one, and, and the theta is in the opposite direction as the moment. Okay, uh, But now that we have uh, rigid bodies we have objects that have, you know, some dimensions. They have some height. You know, we've got a box that's three feet tall, or we've got a bar that is, you know, 10 inches or something. Uh, what about this H? You know, back when we were doing particles, the, the H was just the, you know, the height of that particle uh, relative to whatever we're going to call our ground. So this H, though... Where should we measure it from? We, we, you can set your own ground. Um, and so this height would be the height of, let's do point G, right? Let's do the center of gravity, the center, the middle of our object, right? Does that make sense? That let's just do the height of the center of gravity uh, inside this MGH term. What about this velocity? If, if we have things that are rotating, you know, point A might have a different velocity than a different point on the same rigid body. Well, how about we do the velocity of the center of gravity, G? And also, also let's do the I of G. Let's do the I of G. So for those three terms, for the MGH, one half MV squared and one half I omega squared, let's just all do that for the center of gravity. All right, there are some different different routes to do it for different points, but let's let's just stick with that. Let's do those about the center of gravity g. Okay, this is uh, this is not a vector equation. This is a a magnitude equation. This is just one equation, right? It's not like we've got an i equation and a j equation like when we were doing conservation of momentum, right? Conservation of momentum direction matters. Those were uh, vectors, and so we could, had conservation of momentum in the x direction, and we had conservation of momentum in the y direction. But remember, for conservation of energy, it was just one equation, right? We're, we're, we're squaring these uh, velocities. Um, so it's one equation. What does that mean? We can only solve for one unknown. 
we can only solve for one unknown. Right? So, uh, you know, what if we have two unknowns? And that, that might happen sometimes. What if we have two unknowns? If we have two unknowns, then either we've kind of missed something, forgotten about something, or we just need to figure out how we can relate those two unknowns. Let's talk about these two. A lot of times we're, the velocity and the angular velocity might be unknown, or are we, that's what we're trying to solve for. Are those related? Are those related? Is the velocity of point G the center of gravity of the rigid body related to the angular velocity of the rigid body? Yes, yes. Remember, um, velocity equals r omega, right? Velocity equals r omega. So the velocity of point G would equal r omega. What does this r have to be? Remember, anytime you use v equals r omega, r needs to be the distance from the center of rotation to the point that you're interested in. So, so this would be the distance from the center of rotation to point G. Now, sometimes it is, yes, yes, sometimes R equals radius, but technically R is really the distance from the center of rotation to the point G that you're interested in. If, if the, the figure is very, very clear where the center of rotation is, if you know it's pinned at this point, it's rotating about that point, then just find the distance that, that the center of rotation is to point G. If it's not rotating about a point, if it's not in pure rotation, could we find the center of rotation? Yeah, remember, let's find the instantaneous center of zero velocity. Remember the ICZV. Remember that method, the instantaneous center method? This equation will work if we can find the instantaneous center. So sometimes uh, if we don't have a clear center of rotation, we might have to find the instantaneous center of rotation or the instantaneous center of zero velocity in order to find um, this r. And so we can relate v equals r omega. And so then I say, okay, so maybe v equals 0.25 omega. You know, then I, I plug that in right here for my v, and then I only have omega in my equation. And I would solve for omega. Okay?